I'm Steve McLaughlin, Dean of the Georgia Tech College of Engineering, and this is the Uncommon Engineer. Hi. 1-800. We live in an age... sounds incredibly complex. It sounds like Dude. students, you need to have abilities that span. That's I'm right. really geeking out here. efficacious in fixing the disease, but side effects stop them from making it through to FDA. And so that's, again, where we're trying to help understand how these, because these are really well-designed inhibitors, but just what are the other ways these things are working under normal physiology that it's hitting other organs in ways that cause the problems. So that's why we need to know the levels of them, and that's why we need to know how active they are. And again, I take that back to the computational modeling. So that's where we need to understand in this, or again, a system of these things working in a network, how they're working with and against each other so that we can repurpose these well-designed drugs for those. That's the aspect we care about as far as treating them for the breast cancer, but we also look at them as functional biomarkers because they are turned on in the cancer and they're off in the normal tissue. So we started off thinking, oh, well, this will be great. We can use these as an early diagnostic, but these um, metadata analyses have come out about diagnosing breast cancer early. It's not really reducing deaths due to breast cancer. So what's happening is women are undergoing these mastectomies and just saying, let's just do a prophylactic mastectomy, remove the breast so I'm safe. But it's not necessarily, so some women, again, don't, they wouldn't, the way the studies are showing, they would not have advanced to an aggressive form. So maybe they could have had a more breast conservative um, therapy um, because a mastectomy is a major surgery and then most women get a reconstructive surgery afterwards. So those are two major surgeries women are undergoing and maybe not all needed it. Um, and so that's where we try to predict which women will have the more aggressive form of the breast cancer. And so using these functional biomarkers, we know that uh, white blood cells, they can enter into, that are circulating in our blood, they will leave the blood and enter into that developing tumor and help it advance. So we've been developing ways to profile the white blood cells, because that would be a minimally invasive test, and every time you go to the doctor, you expect they're gonna take blood, and then profiling those to look at if that person were to develop the tumor, how aggressive would that tumor be? And so, uh, to oversimplify, to kind of track what the white blood cells are doing, where they're going, as an indicator of? As an indicator of how they would help that cancer metastasize and break out of its natural or out of its primary I location. I see. And so um, it, it sounds like an, another one of the common uh, threads throughout, in addition to computation, are the enzymes okay. and, you know, the progression from healthy to disease tissue and disease tissue to healthy tissue. Can you say, you know, for folks that aren't that familiar with it, can you talk about the role that enzymes play in that and then how it relates to your research? Oh, sure. Um, so enzymes are proteins, right? Our cells make these wonderful proteins. And we study a particular class, they're called proteases. So they're enzymes that destroy or degrade other proteins. And that is, again, all the tissues and all the structures that we have in our bodies, some cell had to make it, right? Mm -hmm. And so because a cell made is usually made of a protein, lipid, something like that, and so the proteases that we study are turned up in the disease state, then the cell spits them out, and then they start to degrade the tissue around them. 
And the way I always look at physiology, it's a good thing at first because our bodies are always trying to keep us healthy and keep things going. So it starts off as doing a good thing to kind of change the structure so the organ can survive, so other things can come in. And then just because of our positive feedback or we keep doing the bad part that keeps the disease going, that positive feedback gets out of control, and that's when we need to stop it from working. And so is that um, that kind of positive feedback that's, that's needed to, uh, to promote healthy progression, when that feedback goes wrong, what, what's the cause of that feedback? Are these, are these genetic mutations that typically come in? What are, what are the things that cause the, the, so, so the feedback humans. to go wrong? It's usually humans. <laughs> we are the problem. No, not all the time. So when I study the genetic diseases, the problem is the genetics, right? It is there's a system that's off kilter, and the, our bodies have reached one level of balance or homeostasis. But in, as that disease continues and the body continues to try to manage that disease, it has to then push other systems in into a new steady state. I'm throwing all my engineering talk, sorry. Into a new steady state, to, but it has to keep reaching these new steady states to kind of keep things going. So that's the big case with sickle cell. Like that mutation causes these danger, these um, bad red blood cells that are stiff and sticky. And they continue to move all throughout the body, continuing to damage tissue. We can't stop them from damaging tissue, but we can stop some of the damage that happens by turning down some of these programs. Now, breast cancer is a really interesting thing also in that the cancer has now taken a route where it's going to survive for itself. Mm -hmm. Whereas normally the cells are like, I want to do my part, but I want the whole body to be successful. The cancer cells take on a moment where they want to survive for themselves, and they're doing all the things needed to survive for themselves, which then the rest of our system starts trying to accommodate that perturbation, which continues to take it out of whack. And again, so that's where we use the computational modeling to predict now how far will this go, and what is a way we can cut it off at the pass before it gets past a certain place, and that's also where the genetics come in. How come that person A's is really doing it a lot differently than person B's? And that means that the drugs may not work the same for A and for B, and the clinician's going to have to make that decision, not me. I don't want to be a medical doctor. It's too much pressure. But where that took us internationally was um, working with Rudy Gleason, um, who's in mechanical engineering and biomedical engineering. He had a relationship with Ethiopia for years. When I was doing our HIV work in South Africa, he was doing HIV work in Ethiopia. And so we said, well, we should connect. And in Ethiopia, I was there doing HIV work. A student of mine was there for two months with Rudy um, working at Addis Ababa University. And <laughs> There are a lot of problems with me being in Ethiopia with them keeping my luggage at the airport. That's another story. Mm -hmm. But on the fourth day going back to the airport, when I was like, I'm never coming back here, um, the professor we work with there was saying, hey, Manu, I know you do breast cancer work. You know there's this problem of young women getting breast cancer in Ethiopia. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He said, well, women in their early 20s are showing up with stage three and four breast cancer. And, you know, I have a heart. So that's why I want to fix these diseases. And I said, wait, wait, I've never heard about this. What are you talking about? And that was five years ago, sparked a program of we need to come along and help. Because now it is what about Ethiopians or descendants from Ethiopia? What about their tumors make them so aggressive? And it dovetails nicely with my predictive medicine in that now we almost have a positive control for aggressive forms of tumors. So we're profiling them to match that with our computational predictive model, but then also at the same time doing some genomic screening and trying to figure out what makes theirs so aggressive. But where that's become so interesting is we're training up grad students in Addis Ababa University, right? Because they have access to the samples and they are the ones who are there chronically. You all asked me to teach over here, so I have to be over here a couple times a year. No. Um, and just training the grad students on the simple tests. And what I've learned a lot about engineering through my training is what do engineers do? They make it better, faster, cheaper. And in trying to develop something for a low resource country, that's the critical point. So we've got our technology that's simple enough, transportable. We've taught them how to use it. And now they're collecting samples and we'll be visiting back and forth monitoring. So in a in purely a research setting or in a clinical setting? Both. So they are doing it in a research lab, but they go to the the OR to get the samples. Okay. So they're getting patient match, normal, and tumor breast tissue, and the surgeon calls them in. They go and get it, and then they come back, and then they can do the processing in lab. And then does the surgeon take your outputs and, and pass along for... Uh, for treatment options? Or? So we haven't yet for Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. um, they also, this is where that low resource country come, becomes another issue. In the United States, most women are diagnosed stage one or two breast cancer, and we have these great medicines and therapies, for, particularly for some of the 
identified breast cancer subtypes. In Ethiopia, as, as told to me by them, so I'm not trying to speak for them, um, they can't get the antibodies and some of the reagents used to subtype the breast cancer. So they are unable to be able to say you have ER positive breast cancer or HER2 positive breast cancer, which we have therapies to target those. And so that's why we have to, um, number one, do the epidemiology as well to kind of capture the disease so that we can disseminate that and it will be recognized more as a problem. So then we can help bring in some, I don't know, NGOs to help motivate how do you get those drugs to these countries to help these people. So that's where it takes it out of the research domain and makes us have conversations with. Yeah, but without the re- without the research, um we, you would never even be having this conversation exactly. right, with the NGOs. And as you build, as you build the data, as you build your experience, as you as you build the, here's what we can do in a resource constrained country. We can't do that yet, but you have the evidence that those treatments would be successful, or at least this advanced um, predictive ability would improve and again it's kind of where we started from the beginning mm-hmm. there there are patients that need this not not in six months not in five years the, the patients that need it now exactly and that's where take it back to the like you said the computational modeling and the doing a more data-driven models if they're with our biomarkers and the things we are able to measure there, if we're able to use the right statistical model that correlates that strongly with one of the subphenotypes that we can I, identify here in the U.S., then maybe we can motivate, well, all signs look like it is most likely this type of cancer. Maybe you should go ahead and get the drug to this patient and we can move forward. So it's about... I, I love when my students go there because, again, all the things that we have in our lab here are not there, and so they have to think differently about what is a workable solution. And, again, some of the the obstacles that get put in their way are not things that would be over here, and they're like, so how do we get over this one? And I do always think there's a way that technology can work to get around some of those things. Yeah. So the way we do the predictive medicine, our strategy, when I was a postdoc, um, I worked with uh, Doug Laufenberger, who was one of these computational model leaders in the field, and he developed this Q-signal, parad- uh, Q-signal response paradigm, where if you treat with the Q, you measure a number of signals and you match that to a response using matrix algebra or just using math, right? And so what happens there is by measuring these signals, we are able to train a model that kind of that becomes like the decoder. So then anytime you put in new signals, it'll help you tell you what that response would be based on that decoder matrix. So that's why if we get enough patients to help train this model where it's very reliable, now we can predict a number of different outcomes for patients measured in all kinds of different ways. And even for a buzzin' in the brain, there's a cure. You can wear it to pay when your hair flies away. But what you gonna do when you're alive? I was fine. Look at Ralph.